So I'm going to be talking today about updates in MI. I will address them in a question format and question type discussion, okay? So uh, this is the first question and the first concept. So a 60 year old man presents with progressive dyspnea and is found to have decompensated HF with low EF. BNP is 1800, his initial HS troponin is 50 and rises to 80. EKG shows LVH and with no ST abnormality and echo shows a global LV dysfunction with no wall motion abnormality. How do you call this elevated troponin? So this is C, acute myocardial injury. I'm going to remind you here of the definition of MI quickly. You must have a troponin rise and fall plus at least one of the following three features, either a clinical symptoms of angina or ischemic ST abnormality or new Q waves or new wall motion abnormality. So clinical EKG or segmental wall motion abnormality. Without those three, even if you have a rise and fall pattern, the troponin elevation is called non-ischemic myocardial injury or non-MI troponin elevation. This happens to be the most common form of troponin elevation you see in the hospital, actually. It's more common than type 2 MI. People frequently use the term type 2 MI. It's more often non-MI myocardial injury, because more often you have a troponin rise and fall, but without any of those three. The, the mechanism of non-MI myocardial injury, non-MI troponin elevation is similar to type 2 MI, plus additionally, at times, direct myocardial injury. But importantly, that injury tends to be less profound with less frequent underlying CAD, hence the fact that you don't have EKG or clinical ischemia. So it's prognostically better than type 2 MI. Another very important idea is that having a rise and fall pattern does not preclude the diagnosis of non-MI myocardial injury. It will now, having a rise and fall pattern will imply an acute myocardial injury. Having a steady state elevation with no delta is, implies a chronic myocardial injury in this setting. So this patient has acute myocardial injury in a setting of decompensated heart failure. I want you to know this. I, will, uh, I'm, I showed that before, but it's a reminder. There are, those are the types of myocardial injuries you get. So, or the type of uh, yeah, MI as well. So there are four types of myocardial injury. You need to know them well. One is when you have troponin elevation with clinical feature of ischemia and that we call MI. And that is divided into two, the type one MI, which is the primary process plaque rupture, which is what we call acute coronary syndrome. That is divided in non-STEMI and STEMI. Then you have type two MI, which happens in a demand supply mismatch. And this is subdivided in two, type two MI with underlying CAD, type two MI with no underlying CAD. By the way, when we say non-STEMI and STEMI, typically those terms should be reserved for type 1 MI. It's good not to say type 2 non-STEMI, just for term terminology purposes. The term non-STEMI and STEMI are reserved usually for plaque rupture thrombus type 1 MI, not a type 2 MI process. Then you have a third category is that non-ischemic myocardial injury, which could be acute with a rise and fall or chronic with, which, with a steady troponin. The fourth category is MINOCA, which is MI with non-obstructive coronary. The patient presents as type 1 MI, chest pain, positive troponin, no context of type 2 MI. You do the coronary angiogram, you found no CAD, even sometimes a STEMI. Uh, context. You do coronary angiogram, you find no CAD over 50%. This is what we call MINOCA, and this is the fourth category of myocardial injury. 
And there are, I will go over it a little later, but there are four causes of that, just to, so you know of it. Coronary vasospasm, recanalized or overlooked plaque rupture thrombosis with no significant disease left, myocarditis and takosubo. Those are the four main ones. I'll go over it later. And keep in mind, there is this prognostic progression between non-MI myocardial injury, type 2 MI with no CAD, type 2 MI with CAD, and type 1 MI. Prognostic progression from a cardiac standpoint. Your cardiac prognosis worsens progressively. More pronounced angina, more pronounced ST abnormality or wall motion abnormality, more likely to be type 1 MI, or at the very least type 2 MI with underlying CAD. Uh, and it should make you reconsider type 1 MI. If you are thinking type 2 MI, but you have more pronounced angina, ST abnormality, or wall motion, reconsider type 1 MI, or at least consider type 2 MI with underlying CAD. An important idea for treatment, type 2 MI, as well as non-MI myocardial injury, troponin elevation, or non-MI myocardial injury, you do not need to give anti-ischemic or anti-thrombotic therapy, and you do not need acute ischemic workup unlike type 1 MI. Very important. You may need, you may perform ischemic workup electively or as outpatient, and it may not need to be coronary angiogram. Sometimes you may not need to perform anything. It depends on the context, but you generally don't need acute ischemic workup. That's the constant thing. And coronary angiography is definitely not a constant for that group. It's a clinical judgment, clinical context. All right, so I'll move on to the second uh, idea here. So a 60-year-old man presents with recurrent episodes of chest pain over the last week. EKG shows non-specific T-wave abnormality. Uh, his, zero, his admission high sensitivity troponin is 25. His two-hour high sensitivity troponin is 29. The upper limit of normal being 22. This is the 99th percentile is 22. So what is the next step? Cardiac CTA, coronary angiography, stress EKG, nuclear stress testing, or no further workup? Can you try to put your answers? This is a kind of a difficult question, I think. Nobody dares here. Nobody has an answer? All right. So I want to mention to you that all of those questions are consistent with the, AC, with the ESC non-STEMI guidelines. And all of those questions are actually in the second edition of my book as well. The explanations as well as the questions. All right. So I somehow cannot see that chat box for some reason. So I don't see your answers. Anyway, the answer is, I'll go back to it, but I will tell you how to answer it here. Whenever you see those high sensitivity, high sensitivity troponin, remember to analyze two things, the absolute value as well as the delta. So I will give you the algorithm of the troponin T we have, which is the Rush essay, okay? So three categories. The easiest one and the easiest one to know uh, is when you have undetectable troponin or low high sensitivity troponin below 14, below 99th percentile with very little delta. Those patients are ruled out and they can be discharged home with no further workup in the inpatient or ED setting. That's the easy one. Now, once your troponin is beyond that level, you're subcategorized into two. In order, so there is the MI 99th percentile cutoff, which is that 14, 22, 14 in women, 22 in men. But, there, but then there is an MI rule in cutoff, which is 52. And so in order, the problem is that the MI cutoff is very sensitive, but it's very nonspecific for MI, most very commonly having troponin above that level is a non-MI myocardial injury, acute or chronic. 
it's not really an MI. So in order to improve the specificity for MI, a higher cutoff has been used to define MI or to call it MI rule N. MI is still defined by the 99th percentile, but the MI rule N is defined by a higher level that's about three times higher than the MI cutoff. It's 52 for that particular essay. Okay, so, so you categorize this patient in those two categories. The 14 to 52 is the gray zone, over 52 is the MI rule in, which has a 70 to 75% specificity for a true MI, mostly type one, but could also be type two MI. At least it's not a myocardial injury, generally speaking. So that's the first step. Now, even when you are in one of those two categories, you have to look at the delta. And the better way of looking at the delta is to look at the percentage of delta, not the absolute value. You can look at the absolute value and there are specific cutoffs for every essay, but the best is to look at the delta. In the gray zone, the lower numbers, 50% delta is significant. In the higher number over 52, 20% is significant. So if you have those numbers, but your delta is less than 50% or less than 20% in that category, it's not an MI, it's a chronic myocardial injury. And you may or may not need to perform ischemic workup depending on the context. This particular patient, on the other hand, simply because he's having chest pain and it's his first presentation, there is no explanation for that elevated troponin. He definitely need, I think, ischemic workup, even in the setting of chronic myocardial injury, even in the setting of non-MI, non uh, presentation, just because there is no other explanation for that troponin elevation. So basically this patient has a chronic myocardial injury, even though he has chest pain and troponin elevation, his troponin elevation doesn't have a rise and fall, so you cannot call it acute MI. Remember here, you must have rise and fall along with one of those three. So you call it chronic myocardial injury, but in this context, you do need ischemic workup. The catch though, because it's chronic myocardial injury, you do not need to do coronary angiogram. He's not here. He's there and he's specifically here. You do not need to do a coronary angiogram. I think for this patient, you do need ischemic workup. Either A or D are acceptable. Now, my choice here is A, not D, and I'll explain why. But more importantly, I want you to understand that algorithm, okay? So everybody understand rule out, Rule in, which is about three times higher than the MI cutoff to be specific for MI and to eliminate those low level myocardial injury and the gray zone. And whether in the gray zone or in the MI zone, you do need to have a significant delta to define it as MI. Delta is checked at two hours, but when you're in the gray zone or in the high zone, you recheck the level at three hours and you keep doing delta. Uh, my choice is for cardiac CTA for two reasons. By today's standard, cardiac CTA is the superior non-invasive test for CAD. This is based on two, two main uh, sets of data. One is the ischemia trial, which is a revascularization trial, which was centered around cardiac CTA in decision-making. Number two is what we call Scott Hart trial, which uh, randomized patient to, uh, with, with uh, ischemic symptoms to either cardiac CTA or to general functional testing. Cardiac CTA was associated with lower cardiovascular events at five years, specifically lower MI rates at five years. So that's the future, cardiac CTA. Stress EKG was eliminated by the ESC guidelines in the acute presentation. It really is a suboptimal test and you should not use it, see, regardless whether the EKG is normal or not. This is outdated info. All right, there is one catch I want you to know about Delta. It's in the setting of somebody who had a large MI and his troponin, remember, peaks at one day, declines between one to two days and persists, lingers for seven to 10 days. And between two days to seven days, you have a somewhat of a plateau of a troponin. So if you have somebody who comes with a large MI that occurred a couple of days or more ago, you may see a high troponin that doesn't change much. 
that doesn't mean this is not an MI. You're just catching him in the late phase of an infarct at the plateau phase of the troponin. And those patients are recognized by the context as well as by the fact that their troponin tends to be very high. It's not around the gray zone. Well, I'll move on to this question. This is a more interesting question to me. So this is a patient, a 60 year old man. He has a history of cabbage 10 years previously. He presents with exertional chest pain over the last few weeks. He gets pain walking to the bathroom, getting ready for bed, sometimes in the middle of the night. And this is very important. This is what you call nocturnal angina. It's very alarming, nocturnal angina. Uh, it indicates critical disease normally, just so you know, in the proper setting. Uh, so he is requiring nitroglycerin frequently. EKG shows nonspecific T wave abnormality, no, no ST abnormality. Uh, Initial troponin, HS troponin is 10, two hour troponin is 13. Um, upper limit of normal 22. What is the diagnosis and what is the management? What's the diagnosis here? Is this ACS, severe stable CAD or non-cardiac chest pain? And what is the management? NGO, heparin plus NGO or stress testing? B is the right answer here. I think 99% of physicians will call this ACS and it's, you know, and it's understandable, but this is not by today's standards and definition, this is just a severe stable CAD. And that has implication for management. What's the management? This patient definitely needs coronary angiography, but he does not need heparin. So it's B and A, and I'll explain it to you. This patient presentation is absolutely the most typical presentation for severe angina you will see, okay? Severe progressive angina. This is, what he's having now is suggestive of critical disease. So he probably has at least 90% in some major territory, okay? Keep in mind, however, that critical disease does not mean unstable or thrombotic disease. He has a critical disease but there is no evidence of acutely unstable or thrombotic disease. The catch is simple, troponin. We live in an era of high sensitivity troponin. It's very hard to imagine a thrombotic or acute process with a negative troponin. That's why what used to be considered in the past unstable angina is now a dying entity. It's hard to have unstable angina. You either have through ACS, with a troponin rise and non-STEMI, or you have no ACS, no MI. It could be severe, it could be critical, but it's a critical stable pattern, stable CAD, not acutely unstable. He may have had a plaque rupture four weeks ago or three weeks ago that led to that progression. But today, this is not acute plaque rupture. This is an old plaque rupture. In the current era of highly sensitive troponin, a true ACS with coronary thrombosis or, or a resting pain must be accompanied by troponin rise. Unstable angina is thus a vanishing entity. In general, today, the, the patient either has non-cardiac pain, stable angina, sometimes severe, or true ACS with positive troponin. Very few unstable angina, really, in my opinion, and I'll show you more data. So the negative troponin, truly unstable angina is rare and is more in the realm of severe or progressive stable angina rather than unstable CAD with acute plaque rupture, okay? And this is a paper from 2013 by Bronwald himself. And this is before high sensitivity troponin was available in the market. And he says, I mean, he defines that because of those troponin, unstable angina is likely to be further marginalized. Indeed, it's not clear that ACS event can occur without some increase in circulating troponin when measured by a high sensitivity assay. And therefore, while historically patients were classified as stable angina, unstable angina, and MI, he said that we will go back to the 1920s and 30s where Patients with ischemic heart disease are again classified into either angina, stable angina, or MI and no unstable angina. And he laid support to that idea I was just describing. Basically, before we had those high, higher sensitivity troponin, a lot of patients with chest pain 
will not have a troponin above MI cutoff. The MI cutoff for troponin may have been 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 in a range that we now consider MI. So those patients were considered unstable angina. But nowadays we, de we detect high sensitivity troponin in normal in over 50% of normal individuals by definition. That's why high sensitivity troponin is is detectable troponin is detectable is a troponin that's detectable in over 50% on, of normal individuals. And the MI cutoff is very sensitive. So for that reason, it's a shrinking entity. Okay. Any questions? Let me see if, uh, what if the patient has resting pain? Good, good answer, a good question. Here, let me go back. So if you have resting pain, uh, you can call his nighttime angina as resting pain. It's not truly, you know, a resting pain because uh, night is a form of stress. It's an increase of preload. It's a very low level of stress. That's why having no nocturnal angina implies you have critical disease. It's hard to imagine somebody having resting pain that is unstable angina with no troponin rise. Therefore, even if you had resting pain with this troponin pattern, I would still call it severe stable CAD, okay? And outside this context, if you have somebody with resting pain and negative troponin, you can almost rule out CAD. It's very unlikely that you have resting pain with negative troponin and have ACS and therefore in context have CAD at all. This particular patient though, if he does have resting pain, I would still call it, of course, severe stable CAD. I would not call it ACS. Any other question? Okay. I'll move on to another idea. So you have a patient who presents with anterior STEMI. He undergoes PCI of the mid-LED with no issues. He is also found to have 90% proximal RCA stenosis. What is the option supported by the most robust randomized data concerning what to do with that 90% RCA? It's PCI of RCA in the same setting, PCI of RCA before discharge only if angina is present, PCI of RCA in two weeks, do nuclear stress testing and decide and no PCI of RCA, just medical therapy and see what happens, depending on angina. So again, the answer is by the most, the question is supported by the most robust randomized data. Let me see. People say A, A or C. All right, so here is my uh, answer. My answer is C, and, and A is the next best answer. So it's, you know, uh, I think Corina answered that. I, I agree, A, A or C, but the better answer is C. That's the number one answer. And here I'll show you the data. Basically, I don't know, does anybody, any of you know what's the name of the most important trial that uh, regarding non-culprit PCI and STEMI? If you need to remember the name of one trial in this setting, anybody knows? Yes, complete, correct. I don't know if anybody else in you. So the most important trial is complete trial. Let me scroll. So the large complete trial and is the most recent out of them. It's 4,000 plus patient, New England, 2019. They randomized patient to PCI of non culprit disease were in a separate procedure before discharge or within six weeks of discharge versus no PCI at all, unless severe. So PCI before discharge or six weeks in a separate setting versus no PCI. And they found, and that's the only trial out of all of them that found a reduction in three year risk of MI. Not dramatic, 5.4 versus 7.9%. And no reduction in mortality, but at least it found a reduction in some hard outcomes, such as MI. Again, not a huge, in my opinion, not dramatic. And that's why I think still, even that trial doesn't lay ultimate support for performing non culprit PCI, but it provides decent support. That's better than all the rest. 
In the past, we had those two studies, PRAMI and CULPRIT. Each one of them had hundreds of patients. They did PCI in the same setting, non-culprit PCI in the same setting as primary PCI. And they showed no MI or mortality reduction, but they show it was safe and they showed the reduction in the need for urgent revascularization. You got me? So, so those studies tell you that A is acceptable. And that's why in the guidelines is acceptable to do PCI in the same setting but they do not mandate PCI in the same setting. This one showed a reduction in hard outcome, MI. It lays more support for PCI, uh, of non culprit PCI, but it lays support for it at a different timing within six weeks. Kind of similar, Danami Premulti, which is second largest trial, performed PCI of non culprit in a second setting before discharge. This one was guided by so far, and it showed a reduction in urgent revascularization. So everybody understand the timing. That's why I think is the best answer is C. Second best is A, and we do A at times. And B, Thank you. incorrect because I, of course, the, unlike stable CAD where we're really driven by angina, regardless of the severity of diseases, angina that drives the indication. In this context, this is a context where we treat. This is the only context where we treat asymptomatic disease. Is the MI, including non culprit MI lesions. Uh, I'll move on to the next idea here. A 60 year old man presents with shock, blood pressure of 75, pulmonary edema, and EKG showing diffuse one millimeter ST depression. He is intubated, started on nor epinephrine, and undergoes emergent coronary angiography, which shows thrombotic total occlusion of the RCA, mid LAD 90%, and uh, proximal circumflex 80%. Uh, what is the next step? PCI of RCA, PCI of RCA and LAD, or PCI of all three of them? So the idea he's presenting was shock. He has ischemia on EKG. It's not a STEMI. It's more a non-STEMI presentation. He's intubated. He's, um, you know, it's a fairly severe shock. He's requiring norepinephrine. Okay. Mm, let me see here. Uh, let me see the, just the answers quickly. All right, excellent. Uh, the, the answers I see are correct. It's PCI of RCA. It's contrary to our uh, reflexes in this case. All right, you see somebody with shock, it may seem that it's not enough to fix the RCA. You need to fix the LAD. But anyway, so the traditional teaching up until recently had been to only treat the culprit artery in hemodynamically stable patients. And this changed as I showed in the prior question. And the, again, the traditional teaching has been to concomitantly treat culprit and non-culprit artery in cardiogenic shock. Now the evidence support the opposite for both those circumstances. Stable patient may safely undergo non-culprit PCI acutely. Whereas cardiogenic shock patient with a clear culprit artery, and that's the catch, a clear culprit artery, they have a dramatic 8% absolute increase in mortality if non-culprit PCI is performed acutely. So you go from 51% to, from 43% to 51% mortality if you do PCI of something outside the RCA in that presentation. This is the very important culprit shock trial which included non-STEMI, about over a third of patients were non-STEMI, surprisingly, because in non-STEMI, it is harder to delineate a culprit artery. But despite that, even with including non-STEMI, they were able to show an increase in mortality if you perform non-culprit PCI. And there are several explanations of that. Is that. The idea is the sicker the patient is, the quicker you need to be. You go in, go out quickly. That's the big idea of why non-culprit hurts. Non-culprit PCI increased procedural time, supine time, preload, contrast load, which leads to more LV volume overload, renal injury, and is hazardous in the hemodynamically compromised patient. Uh, another idea is that, you know, non-culprit PCI may, may initiate peri-PCI peri myocardial injury, side branch compromise, any injury in the non-culprit territory that's not likely to be compromised in a tenuous patient and will aggravate his situation. Again, the main caveat is that in non-STEMI based on some other sets of data, it is up to 30, 35% of the time, it's hard to delineate the culprit lesion. 
and you may need to uh, perform multivessel PCI for that reason. Interestingly, in culprit shock, uh, only about 9% of patients had, there was only 9% crossover. So I, I am surprised, but that's impressive. Try to limit yourself to the culprit lesion. Okay, that's kind of the idea of those studies. It almost is that, remember, doing PCI in cardiogenic shock versus not doing PCI, which is the initial shock trial, you had a reduction in mortality for close to 10% in absolute value. Now, doing non-culprit PCI on top of culprit PCI, you have an increase in mortality of 8%. You almost eliminate any benefit of PCI by doing non-culprit PCI. Uh, it's an interesting concept. So this is the more interesting trial to me. It's not a board question, although it can be. Uh, it is in the ESC guidelines, but here's how I formulate it. In the prior patient, based on randomized controlled trial, that's the key, based on randomized controlled trial, that's not necessarily what you would do, but based on randomized controlled trial, which mechanical support device is most appropriate? A, B, C, or D? So let's see, somebody answer. All right, I'll give you my answer. It's a straightforward answer in my opinion, D. There's definitely no randomized data for any of those devices. Actually, there is randomized data uh, and there is data showing no benefit for uh, two of them. So here's what I will show you. Those are the randomized data, that the modern one, there are more, but I'll pick the modern one. So for balloon pump, there is a CRISP AMI, which was not a shock trial. It included patients with, with a STEMI and heart failure clinically, and it showed no benefit of placing a balloon pump in STEMI patients. The more important one is IABP shock 2 trial, which randomized MI patient with cardiogenic shock to balloon pump, versus no balloon pump beside PCI. And balloon pump was mostly placed after PCI. Anyway, it showed absolutely no mortality benefit and no benefit of any sort. Uh, although there are catches, there are caveats to balloon, the IABP shock 2 trial. The biggest catch is that they may have picked patients who are too advanced and who may not have been fully cardiogenic shock, simply because close to half of them are post cardiac arrest shock. And it's, a mix, it's usually a mixed shock with, it's, it's a form of SIRS type of shock, vasodilatory shock beside being cardiogenic. So that's the catch of that trial. Nonetheless, that's the largest one and the largest one we have and maybe will ever have. And it lays no support to balloon pump. And for that reason, ESC guideline give a class three for routine use of balloon pump in MI with cardiogenic shock. Now, even more importantly, Impella. Now, if balloon pump doesn't help, that doesn't mean Impella helps. Unfortunately, there are no major randomized trials comparing Impella to balloon pump or to nothing. There is this IMPRESS trial, which has a lot of caveat. It's a small trial and it's almost all post cardiac arrest. So it's really not very helpful. Nonetheless, it showed no difference between balloon pump or impella, and this is the only randomized trial comparing the two uh, from a clinical standpoint. So it showed no difference in outcome, same mortality, much more bleeding with impella, and keep that in mind. Even though it's a small trial, there was a big difference in bleeding, which is expected. The more important set of data for impella, and actually the highest impact studies published for impella are three trials published in the last two years actually. All three very large retrospective analysis, very well conducted, very complex statistical analysis. All three showed worse outcomes with Impella compared to balloon pump. Even most importantly to me, worse outcomes in the current Impella era compared to the pre-Impella era, and worse outcomes compared to match patient from the IABP shock 2 trial much more major bleeding, more death, more stroke, more vascular complications, more limb ischemia, and more hemolysis. No randomized trial, no large randomized trial compares Impella to nothing or to balloon pump in a shock setting. There is an ongoing Danish-German trial uh, that is, and there is one American called uh, Unload 4. So 
here are the studies I mentioned. All three studies I mentioned were two in circulation, one in main JAMA. Uh, this is the more interesting one of them, this circulation one. It's a large US registry of 48,000 patients with mechanical circulatory support, 5,000 impella. And interestingly, they compared the impella era to pre-impella era. And this is kind of as good as you can get in retrospective. You're comparing era. What does the introduction of a device do? You also, they also compared hospitals with high use of impella, which typically in any other uh, study device, if, it is, if the device is good, you get lower mortality in the hospital with high use of that device. In this particular case, hospital with high impella use had higher mortality, 40% uh, higher mortality. Anyway, that doesn't eliminate or doesn't exclude a value of impella. It, it is a big question mark, though. It is a big question mark. This is another study, large US registry, the CATH PCI registry. Very well statistical analysis, also higher mortality with impella versus balloon pump. Those are the three largest paper regarding impella. But here is my take. Why does, why is this, uh, why did this happen? We do know that one of the biggest driver in MI outcomes is bleeding. That's why we switch from femoral to radial access. Major bleeding increases your mortality by two to three times. In some data, up to seven times, okay? Well, you have a device that more than double your bleeding, which is called impella. Well, inherently, it can more than double the mortality. However, there is something great working for impella, which is the pressure volume loops. Well, Impella works great for pressure volume loops. It's the best unloading device that we've ever seen. But does this improvement in pressure volume loops that the company is so obs obsessed with, does it really counteract the increase in mortality that would be associated with a rise in bleeding? You know, I'm old enough to realize that what a basic science success through pressure volume loop does not necessarily translate into a clinical success. And so we have to see. Another catch of those studies, I think, is patient selection. Those studies may have selected patients that were neither too sick or who were too sick to benefit from anything. And I think there is a soft spot for those devices. And this is my take on it. And this is the take to, to a degree of the ESC guideline. Impella or VA ECMO is still considered despite those data and despite the lack of randomized data depending on age, comorbidities, neurological status, shock state outside the two extreme. I think there is a U curve. If you're too mild of a shock, meaning, you know, and I'll explain to you what's mild, or you're too severe, you're probably not likely to benefit. Mild is somebody on a small dose of levofed and getting better. Severe is somebody on mild to moderate dose of levofed and you're needing up titration of that dose, requiring escalation. And I think that may be the soft spot where those devices uh, could work. And this is given class 2B in the ESC guidelines. Uh, I, I want to mention one thing that the companies use, the device companies use. They always show those algorithms. This is, those are a combination of two algorithms. One is from the Detroit Initiative and one from Innova Heart algorithm published in Jack 2019, the Innova Heart algorithm. Using algorithm in cardiogenic shock has, there is suggestion that using algorithm has improved mortality in this era compared to era with no algorithm. But it's the use of algorithm, like using algorithm in septic shock, what we, go, what we call early goal directed therapy in shock, which improved outcome. It's not one specific component. It's that early aggressive management, that early awareness, that getting ahead of the vicious circle of progressive decline of tissue perfusion that improves outcome. Not specifically or necessarily in Pella. It's that early goal-directed therapy that I think improves outcome. The early uh, multidisciplinary approach that improves outcomes. Could it be in Pella? Yes, it's possible. It needs to be proven. But what we do know is that early uh, approach and early aggressive management of shock, using right heart cath and using aggressive up titration may improve outcomes in cardiac shock. But again, that doesn't necessarily mean impella or balloon pump. You have to be careful based on the prior data.
if no comments, I'll move to the next idea, which is a 60-year-old woman uh, is resuscitated, which is the out, out, out of hospital cardiac arrest, basically. She's resuscitated for, from out of hospital cardiac arrest due to VFib. It was a witness arrest with initiation of CPR within two minutes and return of spontaneous circulation at 15 minutes. She had a ST depression on her EKG and troponin uh, 300. She is hemodynamically stable on no pressors, intuba intubated and poorly responsive. What's the timing of coronary angiography? That's the idea here. I gave you favorable features, just so you know. Witnessed arrest with a quick initiation of CPR in less than 10 minutes, actually within two minutes, that's excellent. Return of spontaneous circulation in less than 20 minutes. Those are favorable features. With that said, what's the timing of, uh, of, uh, of coronary angiogram on them? I see uh, number C. All right, good. All right, so here's, my, here's the answer. You need to know that trial here. And I agree, the answer here by current data is C. So there is the, and by current guidelines too as well. I'll go over them quickly. So the, you have the large COACT trial, not COAPT, which is a mitraclip trial, COACT trial. It randomized comatose patient with resuscitated out of hospital cardiac arrest whose initial rhythm was VTV fib and who did not have a C elevation on the post arrest EKG. They were randomized to immediate coronary angiography versus coronary angiography delayed until neurological recovery, five days. The 90 day survival was the same in both groups. It's interesting that there was no benefit of immediate coronary angiography, even though they selected patients with favorable features, good pH, mostly witness arrest, quick return of spontaneous circulation. One thing that came out of this trial that even though most of those patients close to 70% had CAD and their VT VFib was CAD related, most of that CAD in that trial was a stable CAD. Only about 20% was unstable thrombotic, unstable coronary disease. About 50% was a stable CAD, meaning a scar, vita, vifib, ischemic cardiomyopathy, CTO. So that's probably the reason why it didn't help acutely. Another reason is that as it is with any non-STEMI, if they are stable after that cardiac arrest, there may not be a benefit of emergent PCI. So those may be the two reasons why you had this. So as a result of that study, I think the indication of immediate cath in cardiac arrest, BT, VFib arrest is STEMI. But is there a contraindication that could restrict cath even in a STEMI patient? And I want you to know the other end of the equation. The, harm, the, the patients who may not need any cath, even sometimes with ST elevation. And those are the features. The prognosis is particularly poor in patients who have those poor neurological outcomes, those are three, totally unresponsive, even to pain, on no sedation. Patients who are missing multiple brainstem reflexes and patients who display early myoclonic, myoclonic jerks. That's very important. We see that not infrequently. In addition, you have those five features that you need to know that also imply a poor likelihood of neurological recovery and ergo against cath. Older age, initial PEA, unwitnessed arrest or delayed initiation of CPR. The wife finds the patient, she doesn't know how long he has been down. That's, uh, that's concerning. Prolonged resuscitation, and that's one you can always ask. This one, you don't always know how long he has been down. But this one you can tell, how long did it, take, did it take the MS to get to spontaneous circulation? Over 20 minutes is bad, or over three doses of epinephrine. Keep in mind that CPR provides at best, how much cardiac output does CPR or cardiac compression provide? At best, they provide 20% cardiac output. So, you know, if you're under CPR for over 20 minutes, that will uh, correlate with more anoxic brain injury. Or another feature is low pH, less than 7.2. So we have multiple of those. Uh, this patient is less likely to recover. Anyway, so those are the indication for coronary angiography. This is a summary, and this is based from ESC and the SKY 2020. Those are indications for coronary angiography post cardiac arrest. First one is post resuscitation EKG consistent with STEMI, and you have favorable neurological predictor. 
If you have multiple unfavorable ones in a comatose, totally non-responsive patients, or in a patient with myoclonic jerk, then treatment is individualized and coronary angiography may be deferred even if STEMI, and this is based on the SKY algorithm. Now, in the absence of ST elevation, quickly evaluate for those three things. So you don't need cath in the absence of ST elevation, but evaluate for this. Is it an old scar VTV fib? Look for Q waves. Is it an active ischemia? Look for ST depression. Is it non-cardiac? And consider CT of the head, CTPE in the proper setting, blood cultures. So no need for urgent cath, but you may consider cath even in the absence of ST elevation. One, you need to have good neurological predictor. Two, you need to have high likelihood of acute ischemia. So it's not a Q wave type of VFib, especially if you have a profound persistent ST depression and the patient is in persistent shock. It's almost what I would say here, like the indication for cath, urgent cath in non-STEMI. So we have profound persistent ischemia, unstable hemodynamically, and no poor neurological predictor. You may do cath even in no ST elevation. Uh, so I think that's the idea for that. I wanted to talk about Minoka, but I don't think I have time unless some people will want to hang around with me. I can go over it in the next 10 minutes. Uh, do, we, do some of you can hang around for 10 minutes, some fellows? I, I can talk about, uh, sorry, Minoka. Um, all right. Yes, Dr. Hanna. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll go over this case, sorry. All right, you have a 48-year-old man, not woman, man, smoker, reports an episode of chest pain of one hour duration, six hours previously. EKG is unremarkable. Admission HS troponin is 500. Coronary NGO performed during the same day shows mild diffuse atherosclerosis with 30% lesions in the LAD and RCA. So this is somebody who presents with typical chest pain, Positive troponin, significantly high with delta, let's say, cath shows nothing. That's the Minoka. What is the next step? OCT or IVUS, acetylcholine coronary testing, cardiac MRI. None of those just use medical therapy with DAPT and statin. None of those just use risk factor control. No need for DAPT. Uh, all right. I saw answer for C, C, and yes. So I will mention, this is the question that is, that you, you're least likely to get on board. And uh, it is a question that allows multiple answer out of all the ones I gave. This is not, this question has multiple answers. I think the best answer overall would be C. The best question, the best answer in this context would be A. But the more important thing for you is that all A, B, and C are recommended. Okay, now which one is better? The highest yield one is C. Second highest yield is A. Third highest yield is B. Okay, in that order. But I will go over the data here and explain it in a little bit. The second question I want to highlight. Uh, OCT, in this patient, OCT of the LED is performed. Which of the following is true? Likelihood of showing plaque disruption is 20%. Plaque rupture is an unlikely finding. Plaque erosion in situ thrombosis or SCAD type 3 is possible. Cardiac MRI is more likely to detect an ischemic mechanism than OCT. And medical therapy is recommended regardless, hence OCT has limited value. Again, not a board type of question, but I'm trying to uh, give a message here through those ideas and test your knowledge, okay? C, somebody answered C, he's correct. Whoever answered C for that question is correct. Yes, okay. I'll go over the explanation and go back to the answers. But I, at least I can answer the first one. When you have Minoka, all those three may be performed, A, B, and C in a variety of combination. The highest yield is C, second highest yield is A, third highest yield is B. It's not bad or it's not wrong to perform all three or to perform the, uh, any one of them, okay? So 
this is what we call menopause, MI with non-obstructive coronary arteries, which corresponds to 5 to 10% of type 1 MI presentation. Minoca can be in non STEMI, but it also can be STEMI in all Minoca in the three major, or sorry, in the many Minoca papers, including one meta analysis, about a third were STEMI patients. STEMI, you do CAT, you find no CAD, uh, no, no obstructive CAD. Uh, and we define non obstructive coronary artery as up to 50% obstruction. Uh, close to half of them had absolutely no CAD, uh, what we call normal coronary artery, in those papers of Minoka. So there are three main diagnoses suggested uh, by the meta-analysis and by various studies of Minoka. Myocarditis, 33%. The second is infarction, 24 and Takosubo. Infarction could be plaque disruption or vasospasm. It's a combination of both is 24%. This is, those are the MRI studies. Now, there are three modern studies in the last few years, including two in the last year using OCT, one older using IVUS. In those studies, they show if you do OCT in all those patients, including those with absolutely normal coronary arteries, and in those studies, about a third of patients had absolutely normal coronary arteries. So they did OCT despite that, and they found over 40, in, if you combine all those three trials, over 40% of patients had evidence of plaque disruption on OCT or IVUS, more so by OCT. Uh, and interestingly, they found plaque disruption sometimes in, in patients with a fully normal coronary angiogram, and at times in, a, in other patients, even when they have some plaques, they found plaque disruption in an area that on coronary angiogram looked normal. So that shows you how much coronary angiogram can miss in those patients, okay? Importantly, in those last three studies, they did MRI as well. And in all those studies, MRI and OCT were complementary, meaning you see that graph here, it shows you. So you will have patients who had, in, in most patients, you have an overlap, meaning you will see an ischemic mechanism by both OCT and MRI. But you'll have some cases where you see an ischemic mechanism by OCT, you see plaque disruption, but you see nothing by MRI. Maybe because that plaque rupture is not the problem, or maybe because that plaque rupture led to an injury too small to be detected, less than one gram of myocardium, too small to be detected by MRI. On the other hand, you have patients who had abnormality by MRI, but none by OCT. And you can imagine, how can MRI show infarct without an OCT. There is one answer that comes to mind. You have an infarct on MRI, yet you have no ischemic mechanism by OCT. The number one answer is you have an infarct, but no plaque disruption is vasospasm. This is a definite vasospasm when you have infarct on MRI and nothing by OCT. Although it could be that also depending what you OCT, you may have missed the actual plaque. So, those are some important ideas here. Uh, regarding coronary vasospasm, one meta-analysis has shown that if you test with acetylcholine, all Minoka, 27 to 46% of patients will have inducible vasospasm. Again, that's an exaggeration, I think, simply because remember, any plaque rupture can cause vasospasm. In this case, is vasospasm the primary process or is it more plaque rupture? So be careful with testing for vasospasm as a standalone testing, because it could be a surrogate of plaque rupture or plaque disruption, okay? So to go back to my answers here, I hope everybody understood those. So to go back to my answers here, uh, OCT would reveal plaque disruption in 20% of such cases. The answer is over 40%. Plaque rupture is an unlikely finding, it's incorrect. Plaque rupture is the most likely form of plaque disruption mechanism. Other, other forms are found, such as plaque erosion, which you cannot see by IVUS. You have to use OCT to see. To see. You can get in cytothrombosis, you can see a rupture of a calcified uh, nodules. Those are all the anomalies you can see. Another thing you can see is a SCAD type 3, which I'll explain in a little bit. So therefore, plaque rupture in cytothrombosis or SCAT type 3 is possible. Not the most likely, but it is possible. And that's why this is the correct answer here. The cardiac MRI is more likely to detect an ischemic mechanism than OCT. No, they are as likely to detect an ischemic mechanism with an overlap and with a complementary uh, diagnostic value. 
Medical therapy is recommended regardless. That's not true because the mechanism could be myocarditis or vasospasm or SCAD type three. You don't need to give DAPT for those. So it's important to try to delineate the mechanism to prevent future recurrences of MI in those patients, okay? SCAD type three, I will just explain it quickly. SCAD type one and two are usually diagnosed angiographically. Uh, and they have a specific angiographic feature that I explained in the past, uh, including lung disease in a tortuous vessel, lung smooth disease in a tortuous vessel in case of SCAT type 2. The SCAT type 1, you will have that double lumen. You will have that intimal tear with contrast, contrast stain. So that's type 1, type 2. Both are diagnosed angiographically. A little bit more difficult with type two, but both are diagnosed angiographically. SCAT type three is really impossible to diagnose angiographically. It's rare, it's the least common type of SCAT. It really looks like a focal atherosclerosis. The only way you diagnose this is incidentally by IVUS or OCT that you're doing in the setting of ACS or that you're doing incidentally in the setting of MINOCA. If you do find it, it will change your management, of course. Uh, because the, the mechanism is very different than atherosclerosis, okay? Uh, I think I went over most of the ideas I needed to go over here. Uh, in this particular patient, what, what I would do, uh, I would do in this patient, while you're in the cath lab and you see this as an interventionist, you can say, let's do an MRI later. But I think it's very reasonable for us to try to become more aggressive in doing at least in our institution to do IVIS in those patients. Then depending on what IVIS shows, if it doesn't show plaque rupture, we can do MRI. If it shows a plaque rupture, I think it's okay not to do MRI in those patients and stick with the IVIS result. Um, if IVIS doesn't show anything, you can stop and again do MRI, but you can also consider acetylcholine coronary testing. Keep in mind that being a man doesn't rule out vasospasm. Vasospasm in, three, in two European studies, vasospasm was almost as common in women, in, in men as in women. So there is this uh, misconception that vasospasm is really far more common in women. Epicardial vasospasm is probably almost as common in men and women. Microvascular disease is four times more common in women than men, but epicardial vasospasm is probably as common in both. So, uh, Elias, a question mm -hmm. related to the practical management of these patients. So, are you advocating that you do ultrasound uh, for all three coronary arteries, or or, or start p choose an artery and and if you find a a plaque disruption, you're done, or what? You know, what would be your approach there, and and what are your thoughts about the risks of ultrasound? Excellent, excellent question. I, I really like it. I I, I I want to go over this, thank you. So I looked at those studies, what they did, because yes, evidently doing OCT to all three vessels is hazardous. What they did, one, if you have an artery that has more moderate disease than the other ones, focus on trying to image that artery and stick with one artery only. If you don't have any artery that's more suspicious than the other, what they did in those study, they oct the left coronary, both the LED and left circumflex. So they engage the left coronary and OCTs, both the LED and left circumflex. What I would advocate, because I do want to minimize risk, if you, don't have, if you have something suspicious, go for that artery and stick with it. Just, I don't want to triple wires. If you, have, if you don't have anything suspicious, I will go for the LED, which is the largest territory and where you're more likely to catch statistically, more likely to catch plaque rupture simply because it's the largest vessel. That's what I would do. In those studies, to answer your question, they did, they focused, what I did, but it, it, except they did the whole left coronary, LAD and circumflex. I agree with you, there is a hazard. In those studies, there was no, uh, no major complication. I think the, maybe they only had one patient with dissection uh, that was treated uneventfully. Uh, so overall, I, as you know, you know, wiring normal coronaries is less hazardous than wiring normal cor uh, abnormal coronaries. So the risk is very low, but I agree with you. It's good to try to limit it to one artery if you can. And Dr. Hanna, I have a question. Uh, so um, I know in the era of high sensitive troponin, uh, 
uh, the answer may be different, but somebody kind of with very typical symptoms which, of angina, which are recent onset, or maybe an epicenter pattern, or rest, rest pain. So his high sensitivity to pollen, is it negative range, or is it in the gray zone? You Let's say borderline, yeah, the gray zone, no, somewhere 20 to 50. Yeah, that's not negative. Remember, the gray zone is, your troponin is over the MI cutoff, except it's not in a specific range. That's why we use, it's not a definite rule in. But that gray zone in, proper, in the proper context, that gray zone is definitely positive. So if you have a patient in that gray zone, but you have a typical presentation and no other explanation for the troponin rise, it's perfectly appropriate to do coronary angiogram. Okay, here I favor, that's a general approach to non-invasive testing, but you have to always individualize in that gray zone, it's appropriate to do coronary angiogram depending on the setting. Now, if the patient you're describing has very concerning symptoms, but he falls here with high sensitivity troponin, well, guess what? His very typical symptoms are very likely non-cardiac. They may be something serious if he's in distress. They may be PE, they may be aortic dissection, pericarditis ruptured uh, peptic ulcer disease, there could be something serious, but it's highly unlikely that this is ACS. You should think of something else. But if they fall here, then yes, I agree with you. You should uh, consider coronary angiography. Thank you so much. Yes. You need to know that slide, all fellows. I think keep it in your pocket. That's really the algorithm. I tweaked it, you know, to make it more practical, but this is kind of the algorithm of that company, the uh, Roche, and this is derived from the ESC guidelines. Any other questions? Somebody asked about door to unload or to, to place impella in cardiogenic shock, place impella before PCI. This is theoretical, it's yet unproven. There is one ongoing randomized trial called um, unload four, that's randomizing patient with cardiogenic shock and MI to PCI, versus impella followed by PCI. Until this comes, it's all theory. Uh, you know, you have to have strong data to support that. Before questioning unload versus no unload, you have to question the value of the device itself. And you have to prove the value of the device itself. So as of now, you know, you want to put a support device, you can put it before or after PCI. Either way, I don't think there is data for, it's strong data for either time uh, timing approach.